Hi, Dr. Craig. It's, Hi. It's, uh, it's very nice to, to meet you uh, here at Zoom. <laughs> it's the only way. So um, um, I, I believe uh, my question to you is kind of like, uh, more like, a, can you summarize um, exactly how is the B theory of time incompatible with um incompatible with the 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 the, the Kalam cosmological argument because as i understand your 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 thoughts your material you're always arguing pro uh the a theory of time but yes. um i have i have seen um someone someone else i, I don't remember quite well right now that has argued for a theistic position using B theory of time, making uh, some sort of a Kalam cosmological argument using B theory of time. Right. What, is, what is exactly your thoughts on, on this? Because okay. for me, it seems like uh, just as you have uh, just said, it's th there there is not such thing as a instant with a zero zero duration of time. I, I mean, the, the minimum amount of time is the, the Planck time. So any, any event in this universe has a minimal duration of a Planck time. So how, how can the B theory of time be used to, 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 right. to a Kalam argument? All right. The, B theory of time, for those of you who are not familiar with it, says that the difference between past, present, and future is just a subjective illusion of human consciousness. In fact, all moments in time, past, present, and future, are equally real, and there is no temporal becoming. Things do not really come into being and go out of being. That, uh, so that would be what the B theory of time holds. Now. In my view, there's no incompatibility between the B theory of time and the second premise of the Kalam argument that the universe began to exist. Uh, quite the contrary, in fact, I'd say probably most physical cosmologists at least work with a B theory of time and believe that space-time had an absolute beginning um, in the Big Bang. But I think that the truth of the first premise, that whatever begins to exist has a cause, becomes nearly inescapable if you have an A theory of time. Because on an A theory of time, things literally come into existence. Um, before they begin to be, they did not exist. They come into being. And it seems to me just inconceivable that something could come into being without a cause. Um, by contrast, on the B theory of time, to say that the universe began to exist, that the universe lived into being, it just means that the universe, so to speak, has a front edge. Uh, it would be like a meter stick which has a beginning in the sense that there's a first centimeter or a first millimeter. The meter stick has a front edge, but the meter stick doesn't come into being at the first millimeter or centimeter. Uh, and so it seems to me that the truth of the first premise is all the more perspicuous and indeed, I think, unavoidable on an A theory of time. Now, that isn't to say that you couldn't defend that premise given a B theory of time. For example, Andrew Loke may be the person you're thinking of. He is a, a professor at the University of Hong Kong from Singapore. He's published on the Kalam cosmological argument. And in his version of the argument, he tries to show that even given the B theory of time, the argument is cogent. And I think it's certainly true that most B theorists would believe that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Uh, for example, if a horse uh, began to exist at 
three o'clock in the afternoon in my living room, every bee theorist would say there had to be a reason why that horse began to exist at three o'clock. Um, it didn't exist at 2.59, and then it, it does exist at 2 uh, at 3 o'clock. Now, remember, the horse doesn't come into being at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, 2.59, 3.01, all moments of time are equally real on the B theory. But nevertheless, if at 3 o'clock there is a horse in your living room that wasn't there a minute earlier, even the B theorist of time would say that horse has to have a cause. So while I think the first premise is virtually undeniable, given an A theory of time, which I think is the correct theory of time, the argument can still be defended, even given a B theory of time. It's okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig. I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, happy to see your answer to this. Uh, it's like saying that uh, our meeting bec uh, became... Our meeting here uh, uh, was started at, uh, for me, it's 5 p.m. Yes. But in the B theory of time, it would be, it would be, uh, it would happen at any, any time in, in the sense that it would, it, it was happening yesterday. It, it will be happening tomorrow in, in every time. There would be no, ex no exact point in time in which this meeting began. Is that a similar well, analogy? Well, let's be careful here. I, I want to correct you. That's not actually accurate. For mm -hmm. the B theorist, the meeting begins at three o'clock, just as it does for the A theorist. The difference is that that meeting at three o'clock exists there in a tenseless sense. It doesn't come into being at five o'clock. It's, it's there no matter what time it is. If, if it's 2.58 at three o'clock, the meeting is there and begins. If it's, uh, or I mean, five o'clock. If it's six o'clock, the meeting is there at five o'clock and the meeting begins. It, it never changes in that sense. It just exists tenselessly at the five o'clock. But for the B theorist, as well as for the A theorist, the meeting does begin at five o'clock. And he would say, the B theorist would say, yes, of course there has to be a cause why the meeting began. <laughs>